in general, I think we're only looking at uh, deliberate fires of two, um, which is, is very small in, in, in regards to, you know, if we look at the figures for the last couple of quarters, we were four, eight and two over the previous years. So I think the, the good work that the local community teams are doing alongside our partners seem to be reducing the effects that we're looking for. Thanks for that. Um, I know this, this the report is, is up for the last quarter, but um, I'm very aware of the fact that we had four deliberate fires started um, in the Bathys area of Galsby just last week. Do you have any information on that at all? In regards to the Galsby instance, uh, I don't counsel, but what I'll do, I will find out and I will report back to you on that one. Um, I wasn't on duty last week, so it's not something I attended, but ultimately we will have them record recorded on my yeah, there won't be in this report obviously because that was produced as you say prior to the uh, the instance that you're talking about but what I will do I'll get some information on that and I'll report back to yourself when that's up. I appreciate that thank you very much. Um, another couple of things from myself before I open it up. The um, talk about the driving ambition and looking at the fifth and sixth year pupils um, and do we be delivering a, a something over the next quarter. Can you give us any details on what, your, what the plans are and what's, what's going to be delivered? Yeah, well, that's a project I've, I've been personally involved in. It was something that I brought from my own area in Stirling, Clarks and Fife. Post-COVID, uh, unfortunately, the engagement with, with the local schools for road traffic uh, input faded away and it's never really engaged again. It was something I was I was quite passionate about from my previous work in community safety. So what we've, what we've done is we've, we've worked with our colleagues in Stirling, Clarks and Fife. We've looked at the programme that they put out and the presentation they put out um, hoping to be able to deliver that to the local school. So we've been into Donnick Academy and I believe the community safety advocates made contact in Golsby. What we're looking today is work alongside our partners for the ambulance service and local police to be able to produce a PowerPoint presentation to the fifth and sixth year because they tend to be the group that, that are either starting to drive or will be driving in the near future with our, with our friends, etc. And we're just trying to get that message across to them, the, the dangers of driving at a young age, you know, the age groups that are more likely to have accidents, etc. Some of the power points are sort of, they're quite hard hitting. We've also got access now to some virtual reality headsets um, for our national team, and that allows us to engage with the, the young people as well. Um, we're also trying to do that with some local older groups. Um, they are, we're in the process of setting that up as well. But in regards to the, the school's input, um, we're hoping to have the programme um, sort of quality assured, make sure the content's appropriate for the groups and be rolling that out within the next six to eight weeks, uh, all being well, and, and just to make sure, obviously, the sort of governance on it, et cetera, that, that we're, you know, we're showing the right content. So that's something we need to get approved at national level first. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much for that. And one last thing for myself. I'm looking at the availability of stations across Sullivan, and I was particularly concerned, obviously, about the 0% availability in Tongue and the less than half a percent in, in Boner Bridge. Um, I noticed that there are four firefighters actually um, retained in, in Tongue. Uh, can you explain why we had 0% coverage with, with the four firefighters being retained in, in that particular uh, area, please? In, in general, Chair, so uh, Station Commander Paddy Farrow that, that covers Tongue, but in, in general, I know. Tongue and Betty Hill are doing a sort of joint mobilising to try and keep fire cover available in that area there. It will be down to probably the development of the firefighters in regards to that we have to have four qualified BA wearers um, to put a pump out the door, and that's just our safety protocol in that respect. Obviously, we need somebody with a, a, the, the correct driving tickets and the correct instant command tickets to be able to do that. The process of putting a firefighter through that development process until they are competent, we need to be able to get them on the appropriate courses, their courses need to be open, etc. And that's something that I know Station Commander Farrell has been looking at to try and get those numbers up. But in the short term, I know that the, the, the joint mobilising protocol seems to be working in that area um, until we can get the numbers up there. Um, what I will do is I will find out the status of the firefighters and I will get back to you on that and I'll give you a mere thorough report until we have an available crew within that area. Okay, Mark, that's all from me. Thank you for that. I'll open up to the chair. If the floor is good. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Morrison. Yeah, good morning, Mark. Um, just a couple of morning. points. Um, just on that uh, time of Hill, they are sort of uh, have amalgamated the stations, and it seems to be working because at the end of the day, a target of an appliance, uh, even if it is a delayed appliance, is better than no appliance at all. So that, that seems to be working. There is, uh, I think, a couple of 
personnel in, in the, at the early stage of their uh, their training, so that's probably why it explains that part, but you can confirm that anyway. Boner Bridge is concerning because Boner Bridge or Guy area is a big area to be getting people in and recruiting, and we never really had a problem in Boner. It's just over the last year to 18 months that this has developed, and I wonder, this is maybe people retiring, but, you know, I think we should be hitting on that because there is a population there that, you know, that figure shouldn't be as low as that. But it's something we can all work together with. Um, and I'm sure we're happy as members if you wanted to have a, an open day there or something like that, we can encourage people to come along and see uh, how we can get on there. We did it in Loch Inver before, and it was quite successful. And Loch Inver, again, is uh, back down to five, so it's, it's ongoing as well. So we just need to be keeping an eye on these places that are struggling, rural uh, areas struggle, but I have... I can't see why Boner Bridge and our guy should be struggling with the, with the amount of people that's there. So we must be doing something that's just not quite right on that front. Um, the other thing was that uh, PPE for hill fires, heath fires, is there a roll, rollout of lighter PPE coming shortly? Or if you can give me an update on that. Thanks very much. So uh, the first point, Boner Bridge Councillor, um, we have four, I believe, that are in the recruitment pool just now which would make a dramatic difference to that area. Ultimately, as, as you're aware, that the process of bringing a recruit firefighter in and getting to the stage where they can actually sit on a fire engine and be um, classed as a member of the crew does take quite a long period of time. But potentially we have that area covered, uh, but it probably will be three or four months at least before we see any improvement within the availability. I know we do have one firefighter that we transfer in from Dornock during the day and he did make a bit of a difference for a period of time um, on the availability. I'm just trying to look there on the, the previous numbers for it, but that's sort of dropped off again and unfortunately he's not importing in as much as he was due to his primary work. Um, on your second point, Councillor, PPE. The PPE rollout has begun and several of our stations now have lightweight uh, wildfire kit um, I think that's the first stage tranche of the, the rollout has been carried out. They were identified as strategic stations. Um, unfortunately, all the CRU stations don't have it yet because there is an issue in regards to storage because some of these stations are very small, etc. And we need to make sure that we're storing that PP in the right manner. There is, I believe, um, a second rollout of the PPE uh, in process. Um, I have been to a couple of wildfires in the last last few weeks and the crews were comment how good it was so it's something we would like to roll out across the whole of the area but obviously the logistics of storage etc uh, is something that, that, that we're looking at as well before some of these stations will get that equipment okay thank you members, any other questions, members? Uh, i've got one question for mark um, on the Muirburn situation, do you get advance warning that somebody's actually going to be doing Muirburn just in case it was to get out of control? Yeah, so we, we get national reports coming out um, to the area, basically indicating to us, you know, the, the, the high risk areas or the risks that we're more likely to get mobilised to. So that basically comes out in an email for our control room. Unsure of the process prior to going to the control room, but certainly our control room, um, gives the, the, the state commanders, etc., that sort of information up front and it highlights areas where we might have to try and assist crews to be available. If we can, you know, we can look at different scenarios where we can possibly import people in or even pay people overtime to come into those areas if we see them as being a, a potential risk at that point. So, yeah, there is advanced notes, Councillor, um, and it tends to come through ops control. Where it comes to before that, I'm unsure whether there's some sort of national committee that looks at it possibly before that information is passed to. Any other question, um, On the Lockinver station, it would be good to have an update on the recruitment status there as well. Councillor Lockinver isn't one of my stations that I cover, but what I will do is I will speak to the station commander that covers that area, I believe it's station commander Ben Mother's Edge, and I will get back to you on that so that I don't give you any inaccurate information if that's okay. Thank you. Any other questions, members? No, no. No. 
Okay, Mark, uh, thank you very much indeed for your time today. It's greatly appreciated. And uh, thank you for the, for, to all of your fact uh, all the work they do to keep us protected and so on. It's greatly appreciated. Members, we're but, asked to, uh, to uh, comment on and scrutinise the attached Southern performance report. Have we, have we, have we done that? Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. To do. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillors. And I will get back to you with information that's requested. I've took a note of the, the points here that I need to clarify uh, a bit more accurately on that. So I'll get back to you as soon as I have that information. Thanks very much. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Um, okay, members, we on to agenda item number four, which is the progress of school counselling services in Sutherland. And I believe we have Fiona Duncan online, I think. Fiona, are you there? Yes, good morning. Morning, elected members. Um, you have a report in front of you, which has been uh, written by my colleagues in education. Unfortunately, they were unable to attend today. Um, so I'll, I'll go through the report as best as I can. Um, the report provides background to the counselling service in schools in the Highland and the framework it sits in. It's available to all mainstream and special schools in Highland from 10 years plus, and the service is managed by psychological services. You will also see that to date there's been 115 children, young people in Sutherland that have received counselling. That has included face-to-face -face as well as online sessions. And as you can imagine, um, both need to be available because um, young people, no difference from ourselves, will, will have a preference. There are some pie charts included in the report and they give a wee bit more detail as to the referrals um, to the, the service. And as you will see, anxiety has been the, the biggest reason for that. So... I hope that the, the report gives you the background information you need, a bit of the up-to-date information, and if there's any specific questions, I'll certainly take those down, and I may have to link in with my education colleagues um, in terms of responses. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Fiona, and thank you for the report. Um, just a, a couple of questions for myself, and then I'll go back to the floor. Um, in 5.2, it talks about the unforeseen circumstances for Highland Council's largest service provider, um, as proceeds to trade. Um, and then it also says that we've been recruiting councillor posts to deliver in house service. I wonder if you can tell me uh, how many uh, councillors have been uh, recruited that cover Sutherland and what is their general availability, please? So, sorry, Chair, I can't answer those, but I'll take those down. I'll make sure all the questions are responded to. Thank you, Fiona. Um, next question I have is, that, I know that self-referral is, a, 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 is available, which is great. I think that's, that's a really positive thing to do. Um, I'm just wondering what the lead times are. Um, when I know it's 14 days for first assessment, but beyond that, when would a, a young person be able to access the actual counselling? Um, session, for example. Again, I'll get more detail, but I, I, um, in speaking to my colleagues, that may differ as well, depending on um, which schools are coming from, simply because of volume. But I'll, I'll double check that one. Yeah, I, I do know it says report. It says there's a waiting list of of four uh, in, in Southern, which is a very small number, which is, which is very positive. Okay, that's all I have. Members, any questions for Fiona? Just on something from myself, Chair. Um, it would be good to know who the people the councillors actually are. And perhaps can we have somebody coming along to a regular business meeting just so we can introduce ourselves and we get to know the faces and those people who are directly involved in providing the service? Yeah, I think that's a positive thing to do. Fiona, that would, be, uh, would that be possible? Yes, will do. Super, thank you. Members, anything else? Any other questions? Um, in 6.7, the referrals seem to be mainly anxiety, seems to be the main reason for. But going by the figures on the, the um, diagrams there, it looks as if it was decreasing, but I think, I don't know if it's a mistake in that figure at the bottom there, is it? It'd be nice yes, to I think the anxiety was decreasing, but I don't yeah. know if it is. <laughs> No, I think I think it's it is a mistake, and I, I'm I'm with you in in the sense of I think it's about third of all referrals is still remains anxiety. It's fairly constant. 
Thank you. Okay, Fiona, there's no more questions, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'm assuming you're staying on with us again. Thank you. Yes, I will do. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, members. Uh, members, the recommendations are to note the progress to date with respect to counselling in schools, be aware of the very recent changes in some of the provision in schools, and be aware of the wider support in place in relation to mental health and emotional well-being of children and young people in our schools. Um, are we happy to have done that? Mm -hmm. Agree. Thank you. Okay, members, moving on, we're on to item five, Area Roads Capital Programme, and I believe we've got to answer it online. Josie, are you there? She was there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Josie, can you hear us? Okay, we'll give a couple of minutes. We'll wait to see what's happening. Thank you, Josie, for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, thank you, everybody. Good morning. Oh, so, we have, a bit later than normal, the Rose Capital Programme for this year. What I would say is, um, at the time of preparing the report, whilst we knew the roads budget allocation corporately, we have had the the split and the allocation to the area. And as of today, the, the split that's been given was reported in by the committee last week. So, you know, there's the roads based capital of 7.2, the, there's been a top pass of 5.1 million, and there's been a strategic allocation of 7.7. .7. The 7.7 .7 allocation was agreed as I say, last week, in the last week, the week before, it committed with a number of 15 roads um, awarded to Sutherland, totaling just under a million pounds, I think, was the the worked out figure. So that, that those schemes are listed. They do duplicate on the list that I prepared for our capital programme. So what I'll do is I'll look at where they overlap and see where they fit. At the moment, on our the programme I've presented to you, there is a red line. That shows where the baseline capital allocation runs to. It, it's, pretty, it's based on last year's figures, because as I say, I haven't had the split down, but they generally run to about the same, because we've had 7.1 consistently for the last few years. So the red line is based on that 7.2 allocation. The one thing I don't know is what the allocation of the 5.1 top hat is going to be. Um, I, I can give an estimate that it's going to be similar, but um, hopefully this week we'll get confirmation of what those figures are. If, if you look at the Appendix 1 on the report, it's last year's budget allocation. Of the 7.2, 2 million is held centrally for dividing that. So that puts 5.2 million in separated out amongst all the areas. You could, you know, there might be that the 5.1 gets to be up and the same as that remaining 5.2, so we could put double in Sutherland allocation. It might be slightly less, depending on how that comes out. I honestly don't know at the moment. Um, if it does look to be similar to double um, of our baseline capital, the red line would move down to around the 22-23 priority on our list. So we could look at doing that, but also if we look at strategic schemes that are awarded, some of them are within that top 23, so it'll, it'll move about. So that there is, there's a lot of ifs and buts, but also having said that, when this list was prepared about six weeks ago, you know, some of our roads have changed 
and two to priority. So it's a constant review we're doing and um, we'll, we'll just bring that to members at that time. But at the moment, this is the list of priorities prepared in six weeks. All right, thanks for that, Josie. I think, I mean, from my perspective, it's, it's good to see we've got additional funding in there and we're going to achieve more than we would have we, we normally. Um, but I, I, I'm also aware that there's 195 on, on this list and we're going to be able to do something for in the mid-20s, which is always a concern. But it's a, it's a positive thing that we're moving forward. So, so thank you very much for the report. I really appreciate it. Members, do you have any questions for Josie? Just a, a quick couple of shouts here. I very much welcome the inclusion of the B9176 straight road, and hopefully that will be in the, the top 22-23 that will be pursued. Um, it's included in the strategic list as well. There's a couple of sections on that strategic, so that money is, is guaranteed. Um, and also I very much welcome the work on the Elbow Streets. I'm sure your, your staff are well aware that many Elbow Houses were put up before foundations were invented. And uh, just to be careful as you kind of get closer to the, that corner, that's the... Yeah. So it's that advice that's well known already. I'll pass that on. Thank you. Yeah, members? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, I've got three questions for you. Uh, first of all, um, in your professional opinion, what do you make of the Naver Bridge? I will not comment, I'm afraid. We have a structure section that yeah. are dealing with that, and they undertake it. That's the professional people on that, I'm afraid. Okay. The second one is, when will the pavements be done in Border Bridge? They are on the list, um, I think they're further down the priority, so when that list is published for everybody to see. Yeah. It is, I mean, this list I bring to members, this is the engineering priority. This is how we've looked at it county-wide. If members are so well wished, they have the prerogative to change these and accelerate some of these, you know. We have recognised them, but we put them in a priority we think is appropriate for the rest of the network. And the final question is, uh, when are we likely to see the pothole machine in Sutherland? As in the pothole pro or the yeah. rapid response yeah. pothole yeah. Yeah. We um, currently have nobody trained for that piece of equipment. We are organising that training. We we had allocated staff, but we've had some changeovers, so we're reorganising training for that body of work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Good. Thank you. Thanks for the report, Josie. Just a couple points. Um, pretty welcome to see working in the again from our side. It's just disappointing that it's on the other side of the Street, Street, uh, south of the Strathroy, as well, Sharon. Unfortunately, they don't seem to spend an awful lot of time on that. So we obviously need to punch in and do something there. But uh, it is one of the main arteries for the north and west side of the Fed South. Um, and it's good to see that we're doing it for this. Um, it's been happening over the last couple of years. And the rest of it is just, as it is, you know, everybody can spend it all on their own week village, but uh, I think we have to get the list, pick the jobs off, and get on with them. Hopefully, they're not, um, you know, we're, 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 we're trying to appease three pencils as best as we can, which is very difficult. Yeah. The, the, only, the only one I would give you add is if you have any. Idea of what we can do with cash buyers, that seems to be the one that's really getting home to you guys. I don't know if we can get any in house training for that or not. Cash buying is quite a specialty, and yeah. um, we used to have staff trained. The problem we have is it's like an airline pilot, they have to maintain so many hours to do it to keep their accreditation. Um, and sadly, we don't. We, as the budgets reduced over the years, we didn't have the ability to keep these guys accredited. There is a, a, an allocation centrally, and there's a coordination centrally because we have to be mindful of procurement. So I have supplied a prioritised list to our HQ team, our central team, to hopefully um, put that on and get that out this year um, and it be managed by them. Yeah. But I, I share that. And um, the one comment I would make is that in Sutherland we are very lucky that we have our own surfacing skills and so the majority of this work will be carried out in-house. The 
there will come a time when we come to closer to winter where we will review how much work we've done, what we've got left within the budget, and whether it's appropriate to engage contractors. But hopefully, as much as possible, we'll be retaining the cost. Any other questions, members? No. Uh, well, Josie, I, I'm, I'm likely to hear this uh, retain as much as possible in house. I think that makes a, a lot of sense. Um, but also, I'm aware of the, the need to, to spend the money that we've got for, for the year ahead. So I know you'll, you'll, you'll use contractors as and when you have to. So I appreciate that. And I'd also like to, to congratulate you on, on, the, on the proactive reports you did to, to the Elmsdale Millwood uh, Road. So, uh, and I've been working on that as well. So I know you've you got ahead of the game with that. So thank you very much for that. Um, Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. I think it will help with the list of Yes, thank you. Okay. I don't know. I've got two seconds. I've got to check that. Uh, members were asked to approve the proposed prioritised area rules capital programme for Southern Area. Are we happy we've done that? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as always, I'm happy to discuss with members if there's any changes acceleration at area business meeting. On that list, just Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Members, we move on to item five. Uh, sorry, item six on the agenda. The Space Hub, uh, Southern Space Port Biosphere, <coughs> strip public access. And we've got Matt Dent with us today. Well done, Matt. And we've got Corinne online. Um, so if you want to uh, start that, kick off, Matt. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Council. I'll, I'll start and give a bit of background. Uh, I'm sure everyone's aware that uh, the proposal has actually started to build spaceports between Hong and Venice. It was given by the consent in August 2000. Uh, the Lawrence Pine area is quite a small area. Uh, it's two kilometres north of the A38. Uh, and it's subject to several planning conditions. I think the discharge planning conditions are passing places at the moment. And one of those planning conditions is a visitor management plan. So we're not just looking at the bylaw, we're looking at a visitor management plan to manage public access with regards to uh, uh, environmental protection as well as public safety. At the moment, uh, recreational access rights actually in the launch pad, control room and the assembly area aren't affected. We're not, we're not concerned about those. They're excluded from the land of the public uh, by Section 6 of the Land Reform Act. So where, where there's a fenced area or a building, then we're not, we're not concerned about that. But obviously, it looks in Appendix 2. There's a much wider uh, launch exclusion area which is required, which is impossible with the fence. So, from the, from the point of view of safety, environmental protection, and security, uh, we've been asked to look at reducing access rights or restricting access rights during launch events. I'll briefly go over the consideration of public access within the exclusion zone. It's a fairly remote area. There is a few, uh, what you call, I would call, resources that people would go to. So one of them is Ben Boutique. There's the Cliff Tops, the White and Head, uh, and uh, Peat Tracks, actually, in Akinim, Dyer, and Stratham, and a Shedding <coughs> Bobby, Freeshkill, which is a private Bobby, it's not an MBA Bobby. Uh, just outside the exclusion zone, like in that map, there's a core path between Akinim and Townley. It's not affected by this proposal. Uh, the A838 is obviously a public highway. We're not going to, that's not going to consider that, and we're not talking about navigation on the sea. Uh, from the point of view, officers considered obviously restricting public access during launch events, which we understand is going to be for a short period of time, is, is a probably a very reasonable step to take. And, uh, and, 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 and that's, so, so it's a big area. I think it's, I did, it's 5,888 hectares as I've mapped out. Uh, so, is it a, so that, that's a, that is a concern. It's a very large area, uh, but for the, the restriction for the public access is probably going to be quite limited. Uh, so, the Land Reform Act, Section 12, uh, allows us to, allows the Highland Council to undertake bylaws for the preservation of public safety and order, the prevention of damage. And as I mentioned, nuisance danger, and also the conservation and enhancement of natural local heritage. So, as HIE expressed to us, that they tick all those boxes really. Uh, managing public access during launch events ticks all those boxes. So, uh, so that's probably going forward with the bylaw. Uh, and as I said, it will be coming to the access issues will only come into place at specific times, detailed notices. Uh, one thing about the bylaw is it does. Creating the fence, 
So it's not like it's it's a, it's a criminal offence to consider as breaking the bylaw, which is one of the reasons I think that some, some airports have this have this. So it brings it out with the civil into the criminal. Uh, and then just there, we've got a duty to, to monitor this in a period of 10 years' time. So uh, although it might be a long period of time, we've got a duty to review it. Just out of interest, there's only one other bylaw in Scotland from the 2003 Act. And that was just to, to uh, exclude the public from a, a land, a, a, an old landfill, sorry, an open cast mine that then created a large scale uh, arts, art, art. So we've not got a lot of uh, case law or history to go on. Uh, and I know that people might mention camping bylaws in Loch Lomond and National Park, and that was under the National Park Act, so that's not a bylaw under the Land Reform Act. So you've been asked today to consider the proposal and agree to promote the order. So you're not you're not agreeing the order to take forward. And Karen's just going to go and say what would happen if you agreed to go forward and promote the order today. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, Matt. Uh, good morning, members. Can I just check that you can hear me clearly? Yes, I can hear. Thank you. I'll try and keep my voice up. I'm struggling a little bit this morning. Uh, one little apologies, managed to mute myself there. Uh, one point of update since the report was written is that um, going forward, the spaceport will be known as Sutherland Spaceport. So any um, reference to the spaceport in any future bylaws, uh, if you agree this stage today, will refer to Sutherland Spaceport. And as Matt says, um, there are a number of steps that follow at the recommendation today uh, and these are as follows um, we will put the bylaws out for a 12-week notification and consultation period that means that notice will be given in your local newspaper uh, and second the council requires to consult with a number of people these are um, every community council whose area includes an area to which the proposed bylaws would apply the landowners concerned uh, such persons as appear to the council to be representative of the interests of those who live work carry on business or engage in recreational activities on the land affected by the proposed bylaws the local access forum every statutory undertaker which carries on its undertaking on the land to which the proposed bylaws would apply nature scott and any other such persons as they think fit. Uh, purpose being to obviously get um, as much um, input into the process and make sure that consultation is as thorough as possible. So the intention is following this notification and consultation uh, period to report the outcome to uh, council, most likely in September of this year. And if council is in agreement, the bylaws would then be submitted for confirmation by Scottish ministers. So as Matt had said, you've got two recommendations before you. First, to agree to promote the bylaws. And secondly, um, to make the bylaws available for public inspection. And these are as detailed in your report. Um, I'm happy to try and answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Karen. Um, thank you for the report, really appreciate it. Um, a couple of questions for me, just for clarification, maybe. I'm, 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 i for, for two years, you can apply a, 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 an exclusion for more than six days at any particular time. That way, that, that works. I see the question again, sorry. <laughs> it's just looking for some clarification on 7.2, Matt, in yeah. the report. It's, yes, uh, the council can, like for something like the Strathpeffa, Strathpeffa Cycle Race or the Snowman Rally, the council can exclude access rights from an area for six days. If we go over the six days, we can we can apply to the Scottish government to confirm an order for two years. Oh, so you can, you can actually have a student for a period of two years. years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is that is that maybe likely at all in that this instance? The the section eleven order puts quite a lot of work on to the council to promote the order. 
and we'd have to do that uh, every two years. And it might not seem a lot of work, but we're doing it every two years in the process of applying to first ministers and you know doing their uh, it's advertising the notice again. So it's not just resubmitting the order in section 11 notice, it would be doing it every two years and doing the same work again every two years. And also the bylaws allow us to manage the launch exclusion zone in a in a phase manner. So during non-launch events, which is potentially most of the winter, then with there'd be no bylaw in place, uh, Councillor Gale. Yeah. So we would just be able to manage the access restriction during the time of leasing bits or the operator sees bits. So it could be for a matter of days where the access exemption or section 11 is a start date and then a finish date. So in theory, the restriction on that 5,788 hectares would be permanent. Hmm. I, I, don't, I don't consider that reasonable. We don't need to exclude an area if there's no launch event. And that may, may be slightly confusing for the public. There might be signs up saying no access. So like Cape Wrath, the, the order is only in place when they have flights and when they're, uh, they're marshalling the, what you call the outpost, what you call it, you know, the, the sentry. So the Bible gives us more flexibility. Uh, we, there's no the, there's a, there's a potential for an order to be revoked and then started again and revoked and started again, but then that that again puts a lot of work on the council. Yeah, sure. So although it, it, although it maybe looks a slightly heavier tool to use mm -hmm. in the longer term, to medium term, it's an easier tool to use. Yeah. Right. So it's a permanent order as opposed to a temporary order. Yeah, no, I was concerned that 5.1 there, Mark, because uh, obviously you're going to exclude that area completely. No, it's <laughs> Um, but they recommend for a lot of people, so yeah. that would just be the, the kinds of, as you say, specific kinds of, of blockchain. I haven't said in here, but maybe we should have done anyone that's got a right to access the land for, you know, as a grazing tenancy or as an owner or express permission of the owner, they're not affected by the bylaw. So it's only people that are exercising access rights as opposed to the 2003 Act. So. Uh, croft intent, croft animal, the croft in tenure, and uh, there are certainly, I've, I've looked yesterday, there's actually a croft actually on in the launch exclusion zone. Yeah, and I suspect there's more than one croft, yeah. and I suspect that the grazing yeah. rights as well. So they're not, they're not affected. Yeah, there will be a, a common grazing part of yeah. it as so well. The pressure still has is obviously how the one that this, uh, the ship is supposed to use, but regular. And, uh, so, no, I'm comfortable with that. I just thought the second bit. <laughs> we, don't, we, we don't know the time period yet. Yeah, in theory, it could be a matter of hours. Yeah. Uh, and with technology to monitor the launch exclusion zone, it could be it could be up to that state in a few hours. So we could be looking at a day or two before. But then we don't know about. We we, we have had those discussions with the new operator, which is all about how long they would take for the weather window, for example. I, I didn't mention how like, it's only, well, at the moment it's only 12 launches a year because they're discharging the rockets to the sea. Mm -hmm. So unless, unless they come and change that, we we're only looking at 12 launches a year. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, it, we're, not, we're not assuming it's going to be once a month because obviously it's going to be in the season. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, one question I have is, and also in the report, it's the um, exclusion is going to be enforced by HIE. Uh, but how would, how would they go about doing that? And, and I'm also wondering when the exclusion period is there, how would you actually clear that massive area? How, how does that physically work? Well, I'll answer the first question and Karen can maybe uh, answer it as well. But the second question we, we, is too early to say, but the first question is in terms of who would operate it. The, the 2018 Space Industries Act allows that there, there has to be a licensed operator. On the, on the spaceport and also essentially a licensed range operator and then they're, 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 they're given a license by I think UK government so we, we're going to essentially pass that uh, the, the, the bylaws can be worded in such a way that we'll pass that duty on to the operator or the range licensee uh, and they'll, 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 they'll do the undertaking of that and I don't know if there's anything else to say to that that's, that's how we are hoping to work the bylaw yeah. I, I'm 
sorry, my brain, my brain is perhaps a little fuzzy with the cold this morning, but in terms of what's happening here, it is a bit of an unusual situation that, in effect, the council has been asked to promote a bylaw on behalf of a third party, but our approach to monitoring and enforcing it is is to pass that duty on because quite simply you know the council does not have the staff manpower to enforce um, something that includes such a wide area. I suspect in practice there may well be some sort of drone operator involved as part of monitoring the boundaries of this particular site given it is so large. Um, Apologies if I've missed or answered the, the same question as Matt has. Uh, Chair, do come back to me if I have. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to elaborate that because obviously Cape Wrath is exactly the spot this yeah. model is going to be on. So they have range wardens and they have range flags that go out and they go around the perimeter with quad bikes and they have their red flags and they, especially near sort of walking areas and walking points where they come through that part of the range. And it gets then put sensory posts and it's monitored like that. So it'd be much the same out of margin. Yeah. I mean, the range staff that the Cape Wrath or a private yeah. contractor. Yeah. 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 The Cape Wrath is probably quite a good example. If you're, apart from Hacking in there and Town Bean, it's a little bit, little bit more accessible than crossing over the Kyle or walking from Stanford. Yeah. So some of, some of the range is quite easy to look at from the main, you've got a, a nice physical barrier here, 3 8, and you've obviously got three. The sea on two sides. Uh, we have how about that second, the second point to your question? We don't know the cat's for kale. But that would be the case in any 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 order that we pursued. Any visitor management plan that question would arise in any case. Uh, it doesn't matter. The bylaw doesn't 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 change that. They need to keep an area safe. Uh, the two of us, every other launch zone so proposal in Scotland, is still from the land. We're still going to be public access concerns, so it's not unique to this area as well. Everyone's good. If you want to space industry in Scotland, you could have that from land with managing the land in some way. I might get to Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions, members? Mm -hmm. I think that will be in the business management plan. So that's one of the points of this management plan is obviously managing the A38, managing uh, other viewpoints. And I think we're expecting that be, uh, we're, I'm, I'm expecting, we're expecting obviously quite a lot of interest in the view of it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know with any kind of expecting it to be one of the mill. <laughs> uh, like when a, a cruise line of the size of the Titanic comes into a mill and everyone looks for a few days and then yesterday it came and went without anyone noticing. Uh, so they would, I think, and that they, they have mentioned that in their in their understanding as well as security, environment protection and safety, they have mentioned the opportunity that this management plan would provide economic benefit other than the straight uh, range staff. Uh, how that would be, I don't know. Uh, with as well as this management plan, I think they're certainly expecting uh, some kind of maybe traffic order on the highway. Otherwise, I know it's a two-lane road. It's quite a good road in the north, but it's it's not going to cope with hundreds of cars uh, along the highway verge on both sides. Uh, with Tong and uh, then Street and Sheriff uh, yeah. fire station. <laughs> I think it's still one for the park and ride scheme. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Plus people into the new points. Mm -hmm. The car park that the council's been involved in at the Moyne House, mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly popular. It's a very small car park, but people like it. It's a good viewpoint. A, it is a, it is a, it is a well-known area. People do want to visit the White House and the city viewpoint. That will probably be less covered in the wider list of management plan. Thank you for that, Matt. Mm -hmm. I expect a lot of people will go then and hope that day. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's surprise. <mighty surprising. laughs> <laughs> might go park and write then hope and then oil. <laughs> okay, members, any other questions for Matt? Hi. No. No. Okay. Okay, members. We are asked to read two recommendations to agree to promote draft bylaws to restrict public access to the launch exclusion zone associated with Space Hub Sutherland during launches, and to make the proposed bylaws available for public inspection, and to consult those persons and bodies set out in Section 12, 7 of the 2003 Act. Are we happy to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Karen, for your time. Much appreciated. Thank you, Chair. Thank you.
Okay, members, moving on. Uh, it's a housing performance report and quarter four. I'll leave you to this. Yeah. I'm a little upset. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have Lena and Colin Sutherland online, I think. Uh, there she is. Morning, members. Morning. 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 Can you hear us okay, first of all? Yeah, can you hear me fine? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So I've got present yeah. I've got presenting with me today Colin Sutherland. Colin will be responding to any questions on the repair side of the report. So members are asked to consider the Sutherland Housing Performance Report for year twenty two to twenty three. Firstly, if we can go to section five of the report, please. This details our area repair statistics. Item five point three shows the length of time taken to complete emergency repairs. Sutherland has continued to be within the 14 hours target throughout the year, with the exception of North and West Sutherland in quarter three. And if we go on to item 5.5, this details the average time taken to complete non-emergency repairs. Both wards were unfortunately out with target in quarter one. East Sutherland remained in target for the rest of the year, and North and West Sutherland continued just above target, but within the benchmark. Efforts are being made by our building maintenance team to reduce the response times, though the travel distance to North and West Sutherland continues to be a challenge. We can move on to item six of the report. This is our tenancy management information. The average relay time target is 35 days. We are out with the target, with, but within benchmark. Contractor travel time and low demand properties in North and West Sutherland have, contribut have contributed to our overall statistical performance. Item seven of the report details our information on rent arrears. We have seen an increase in our rent arrears and this is a trend and and across Highland. Officers are referring tenants to Highland Council support services such as housing and intensive welfare support as well as signposting to external agencies such as Citizens Advice and charities to help with the cost of living crisis. Finally, item eight of the report shows our homeless presentations. Apart from an increase in quarter one, the overall number of presentations remains low in Sutherland. Um, we're happy to take members' questions. Thank you for that, Marina. Um, I've got a few questions before I pass it onto, onto the floor. Um, first of all, with the targets for uh, repairs, it's really good to see that the, the, the emergency repairs have been done within targets. That's great. Thank you for that. And the non emergency repairs are, are slipping a lot of it. I understand that. And I can just clarify what we're talking about in terms of non emergency, because I know that we've, we have, we've had cut back in terms of non essential. Can you, as, as, can you clarify that non-emergency and non-essential, are they the same thing? Um, because we're not, we're not, it's just a, it's a terminology. If you can, if Colin can maybe clarify that for us, that would be very useful. Yes, I, I, like an emergency would be uh, if someone needed their locks changed or their window broken. But a non-essential would just be a run-of-the-mill repair to do. That that's not needing someone there within that eight hours. You know, it could be a paving slab outside, some, something quite simple, you know? Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just a terminology call more than anything else. I'm saying, yes, I'm saying yes. Non repair is a non essential repair. Yeah. Okay, thanks for that. Just a little bit of clarification. Um, going to, to the wedding, uh, how many boys at present are, do we have in Sutherland? And where are they? Um, we, yeah, we've got, I mean, properties that are currently lying void that we haven't allocated out yet, or properties that we've got which are void, which are actually in the allocation process. We've got, we've just got a small hand, handful, about six, and we've got two which are hard to let at the moment. Where, where are they? We've got one in Loch Inver and one in Melvick. Thanks for that. Um, right, I'll open up the floor to members' questions. Mr. Morrison. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. It's just on the, the staffing levels for um, your tradesmen, Paul and Paul. Um, 
Are you fully staffed out with trades persons, or is that something you struggle with as well? Well, at the moment, we've got our full joiners, full plumbers, but we haven't got any electricians in-house and we haven't got any painters, but we never, we haven't had these in-house for, for a long time, but that would be a big help and we keep asking and we keep pushing for that, for that trades. Uh, it's hard to get contractors to go out with their own wee area. You know, to get someone to go to Loch Inver and, and to your own place to Dernis, it seems to be more of a challenge eh, to get them to go there if we need them to get there. And, and how many uh, joiners have that have you got? Like, what, what's your staff levels? How many? We have we have five joiners plus an apprentice, and we have a uh, two plumbers and an apprentice. We have three labourers and one bricklayer in Sutherland. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, with regards to rent of rears, Marina, um, what, what's the average rent of rears uh, at, at present? Our rent arrears are relatively low compared to the other areas. We've only got four rent arrears which are sitting be above the 2250 level, which is above the eviction level. Um, the majority of our rent arrears are, are below £1,200. Um, we've got most of our tenants are engaging quite well and they're, they're taking the support that's offered to them, which is really encouraging, especially in, in the current climate. Um, but we do have some tenants who just will not engage with us and that, that is a challenge for the officers. I appreciate that. Um, I'm just looking at the figures for quarter four at uh, East Sutherland and Everton, £42,321 in rent of years. Um, yeah. Just for clarification, what, 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 what would a normal rent income be um, across Sutherland? And uh, what's that percentage with £42,000 be? Well, I, need to come, I don't have that figure to hand, I'm sorry, but I'll, I'll pass it on to you after the meeting if that's OK. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks, Marina. Um, it just, question I have for you. Sorry? Yeah, just for members' information, you know, I was looking at the rent arrears yesterday, um, and North West Sutherland is currently sitting at 30,266, and East Sutherland and Edgerton are at 41,963. The arrears fluctuate depending on when the reports are run, so it depends on when, for example, the universal credit comes in, the direct debits come in, so it does fluctuate throughout the year as well. Appreciate that, and you know, I know that impacts on on the rent of yours uh, regard to housing benefit. Um, one last question I've got here, and it's just curiosity from my perspective, and you may or may not be able to answer it. I don't know. <laughs> it's to do with homelessness. Uh, what have, have you had? Have you seen any impact from the closure of the Women's Aid Refuge in Inverness with regards to, to homeless applications? Um. No, certainly not now, Dave. And we had our homeless working group yesterday, and that wasn't an item that was raised at that working group, and that's where it would normally present itself. So I can't see that there's been an impact. Okay, that's good. Thank you very much. Any, any other questions, members? No? no. Okay. Um, back to recommendations then. Mm -hmm. uh, we are invited to scrutinise the information provided on housing performance in the period 1st April 22. 31st of March 23. Are we happy we've done that? Yeah, yes. Okay. That's great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marina and Colin. And thank you for your time. It's greatly appreciated. Um, you're, you're welcome to hang around if you want, but I suspect you have other things to do. Thank you, members. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Okay, members. Item 8 on the agenda is Community Regeneration Fund Assessment of Applications. And I think we've got Paula and Fiona. There's just one or other. Uh, Paula's just about to join the call. Okay. Good morning, Paula. Are you there? Can you hear us? Oh, hello, members. Oh, don't know. I'll get my camera on. There we are. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was a, good, thank you. I wasn't expecting to be on so soon, but I was here waiting anyway. So sorry if I was That's keeping you for well. too long. Okay, well, it's one item eight. It's the Community Regeneration Fund. If you want to present the report, please. Thank you. 
shall I make a start? Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so members will recall that back in January this year, um, 17 applications with a total value of nearly 700,000 um, were approved funding from the Sutherland share of the 22-23 Community Regeneration Funding. So at the moment, this means that there is a balance of nearly 70,000 available of unallocated funds. Um, and as you're aware, that community regeneration funding is an umbrella term for several funds um, that communities can bid into. And this includes the Highland Coastal Communities Fund and the Place-Based Investment Programme. So just to give you a, a little bit of an update, so um, so since the the last committee in January, um, nearly eighty two thousand um, pounds has become available available from the first round of the Highland Coastal Communities. Um, so this was back in two thousand and twenty one and twenty two allocation of, of that fund um, because unfortunately two projects are, are unable to progress. So. Um, yeah, so this means that the financial position of CRF funding available in Sutherland today from the two previous round of funding is £151,673 um, of, of unallocated funds. So, um, so in the report today, so that there is one um, application requesting funding, and there is there is a recommendation to ring fence some of the funds. So, the application presented today is from the Dorna History Links Museum. Um, so, they submitted an EOI during the last round of CRF funding, but they were deferred um, because they didn't have a, a lot of uh, match funding. So, um, but since then, they have actually just recently been awarded a, a large grant from. HLF funding and on this basis um, they were invited to present a, an application for funding today. So members are asked to consider whether to um, agree um, to approve, defer or reject this request today and I will go through the technical assessment uh, in a moment. So in terms of, in terms of the recommendation um, so members are asked to ring fence um, the remaining balance of the funds available um, if the History Links Museum um, is approved today. Um, so this is to um, go towards the development of a, a county-wide transport project. So currently um, this is at its early stages of consultation. So by ring fencing the remaining balance of funds means that this project can progress um, and once developed, a full application will be presented at a future um, committee for final consideration. So in terms of uh, the technical assessment for the Dorna History Links Museum, so um, as with all uh, full applications, the development officer assesses um, whether these are technically eligible and we give a, a red, amber or green status for each of the funding criteria. Um, and a summary of the RAG assessment for the History Links Museum is in uh, Appendix 2 of the report. And I can confirm that this project has satisfied um, this assessment. Um, so the History Links Museum, um, so this project is to build an extension on the existing building to create a new flexible space for um, to, for exhibitions and to act as like a community hub um, so this can support local activities and events in the area. So they are requesting a contribution of 50,000 from CRF funding um, and this will go towards phase three of the project so we, this is the construction phase but just for clarification the application has actually presented um, phase four costs as well but this is a separate phase to CRF funding um, and they are securing um, a, you know a separate funding package for that phase four. Um, so the total cost of phase three which 50,000 is being um, asked today to contribute towards for is um, so the total project cost will be 559,000. So I did um, go back to the applicant just for clarification how that funding package is made up um, and to date they have secured um, 388,000 of which 250 of that is from HLF funding so they've done really well to secure that um, and they have several funding 
applications um, currently pending decisions and I believe some of those will be uh, decided on today and with the others um, over the next couple of months or so. Um, and it's, it's a really well developed project and um, they have planning in place, building warrants, so it is pretty much shovel ready once they have secured the, the funding package to get that construction phase going. Um, there's a good good level of community support. They've done um, quite a bit of consultation during the first phase. Um, there's a fe feasibility study and a business plan for it. Um, there was a tw 20 letters of support submitted with the application. Um, and they've also, uh, they also did a visitor survey last year. Um, and also they have consulted with a wide range of local people and youth groups, for example, to create like an activity plan of what the com community would like to see. Um, using that space. Um, so yeah, all in all, well-developed project and yeah, um, good to start once the funding package um, is in place. So, so I don't know if members have any questions in regard to that application. Uh, thank you very much Paula, for that report. That's very comprehensive and much appreciated. And it's, uh, thank you for, for all the hard work for yourself and if you want to do uh, for our community as it is. You, you, Help so many uh, projects progress and, and uh, help communities to achieve what they, 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 they uh, aspire to. So, thank you very much indeed. Uh, members, uh, does anybody have any questions? Just a comment, Chair, that I'm very grateful to Paula and uh, Fiona for the work they've done in this and putting it forward. And I'm very grateful to members for allowing it to be pulled back into play. It's a very important project, that corner. And uh, we work very hard to get where they are. So. Hopefully that members can agree that the funding will be well used. I think there was a, at some point an element of crowdfunding, but that has been underwritten by a local benefactor. So uh, I think every, everything will be quite secure. And they really are keen to move ahead in the early autumn to get this underway and ready for the next uh, next season in, in 2024. Okay. I also think the idea of a, an overall um, Southern transport scale is, is an excellent idea and that's uh, worth pursuing and worth putting the, the funding into. Well, any other questions or comments, members? Thank you. Okay, members, we are asked to consider the application presented for funding and agree whether to approve, defer or reject. Um, I would move that we, we, we approve. I uh, also have asked that we, as the application, should receive funding award from CRF, which uh, and also to agree to bring things to balance of the remaining funding for a transport project. Are we all happy to do that? Yeah, okay, that's great. Thank you very much, team members. Paula, well, thank you again for your time. Much appreciated. Uh, okay, thank and, you. Uh, uh, thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, cheers. Bye. Uh, okay, members, moving on. We have uh, item nine, repurposing PDI repair for both the public toilets report. Um, I, I don't think we need to, to, to have a, any uh, anyone to represent that report. Um, are you you're all aware of it? Are you happy to, to agree the recommendations, which is a contribution of one thousand eight hundred seventy-eight pounds towards the repair of both the public toilets? Great, great. Okay, thank you, members. Uh, moving on again. I'm going to get my machine to work here. I'm going to move. Okay, I'm going to right, item number 10 is the Donor Common Good Bond application for the following county committee approval. Um, I'm sure I will be happy to get that one. Okay, thank you, members. This is the same project that Paul has been talking about, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, the relevant parts, I think, are that the application to the Common Good is for £50,000, so it's the same as coming from the CRF. Um, as noted, the Donor Heritage Scheme has a good track record of raising funds, so they make a credible case for filling any remaining gap in this category will be largely uh, the community council who we uh, consult on these applications has expressed their support for it. The £50,000 application of the grant would be in addition to the budget agreed by members of February, which is why it's before you. 
but the estimated balance at the end of March was 313,000, which means that 50,000 pound grant is accorded. So members are recommending to approve a grant of £50,000 to Donald Heritage to deal with the history links museum extension project, subject to much funding being in place. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Members, I think we've, we've uh, seen the presentation from Paul earlier, and this is just the final uh, part of the particular jigsaw. Um, and we have a recommendation in front of us, which is uh, to approve, approve the £50,000 to Donald Heritage to deal from the Donald Common Good Fund. Uh, we're happy to be happy to do that. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, members. Okay, item eleven on the agenda is the award discretionary awards. Now, uh, I think we've, we've all had access to this. I don't uh, intend to call anyone to, to, to report on it. Um, the, all the details are there. All the funds that we've, we've uh, delivered over the, the period. Um, I'll be happy to approve and uh, move these awards. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be very well spent. Thank you for that. Right, final item on the agenda, I believe. That's the thing I've watched, um, is the, the minutes. Uh, uh, so the minutes, uh, we got certainly the minutes for the Southern Committee Committee held on 24th of January. I want to approve by the full council on the 9th of March. Do we have any members? Uh, so approval is just for just for, just for moving. Yeah. Perfect, yeah. Okay, I'm happy with that, members. Yeah, I'm happy. Okay. I think that brings us to the um, end. I to, just to draw members' attention to the bulletin. Okay, members are requested to know the details of other issues of interest relating to the Southern County Committee are available through the bulletin on the Council Internet. And the end, but also the invitation to pay income from the parking charges and the uh, car parks around the county. And that information is available for everybody to see. Uh, are we happy that we have access to that and we've all seen that information? Mm -hmm. That's the interest, really. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, members. That brings us to the end of our meeting. Thank you very much indeed for your attendance. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Well